Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being on with us tonight. Amir Hul and I are really, really, really excited to be here with you all tonight. Um, obviously, I'm joining from Colorado and she is joining from Florida. As Samantha said, we both formerly worked at Department of Children and Families, so I recognize a couple names on tonight's webinar. So we are super pumped to be here and just excited to share just a little bit of content with you tonight around nonviolent communication. And tonight's webinar, like Samantha said, is gonna just be a part one on using empathy. And when we talk about nonviolent communication, it's really a language, it's a process, it, and it really helps me and others like guide our own lives and how we communicate with others. And really when we use this process and way of thinking um, about conflict, it really leads to a couple outcomes, um, which mainly are that it, there, there's greater connection, there's a greater sense of understanding uh, with others and openness uh, to approach conflict in a way that uh, allows us to be a little bit more resourced when we're coming into that space. Um, we envision a world where nonviolent communication is at the crux and the core of all communication processes and where everyone's needs really matter. Uh, so we'll get into it. So our learning objectives for today are really focusing real briefly on trauma. All of you have probably heard of adverse childhood experiences. So going to move through that super quickly. Uh, but really the point is the connection piece between trauma, ACEs, and the brain and nonviolent communication. Um, we're going to talk about how we typically and how you typically respond in conflict situations, both personally and professionally. And then by the end, you'll be able to explain what other conversational responses are, how to actually give empathy, including the three components of empathy, the difference between feelings versus thought feelings and needs versus strategies. This is where we'll have a little bit more engagement from the audience uh, and, and interaction. And before we jump into it, I did just want to say, too, that we do have uh, three shorter videos in the beginning, or uh, excuse me, two shorter videos, and then one that's going to be about 13 minutes. So the front end of this webinar will be a little bit more video content heavy, and then the rest of it will be more interactive and uh, uh, learning more of the content in detail. All right, so bear with me as I transition to... Uh, showing this little video clip. This video clip is uh, one of my favorites. It's down. Sympathy. All right, so let me share this tab instead. <sighs> So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us. 
that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So when we think about the value added of NBC and trauma, um, NBC trauma and the brain, there is one other short video that I really like uh, that the Big B Method, who does a lot of um, coaching and training around the country and in this skill in nonviolent communication, she put together this uh, two minute video that really focuses on this concept of when we perceive a threat or there's a real threat how that impacts our brain and our amygdala and how we show up with fight, flight, freeze responses. Again, why I really like this video is because it's quick, it's to the point. Most of you probably have already heard about ACEs and benevolent or positive childhood experiences, uh, fight, flight, freeze, trauma, right? We're working with uh, populations that where most of us have experienced trauma. So I'm gonna play this video clip here for you. And bear with me as I shift over to that one. Ever wonder why there's so much conflict in the world? Research tells us roughly two out of three of us experienced trauma as a child. Trauma changes our brains, programming us to constantly be on the lookout for threat. And whether the threat is real or perceived, to respond with our caveman-like fight, flight, freeze response versus responding in a rational way. To reduce conflict, we need to learn to use the higher part of our brain, the part that understands that when threatened, we have options other than to fight, flee, or freeze. And to learn to use our higher brain, we need physical and emotional safety. Physical safety isn't that complicated, but to experience emotional safety, we need to remove judgment from our communication. This is key. You probably don't realize, but most of the things people say are judgmental, not based in fact. So when someone says, you're late, that's probably a judgment. You're really disrespectful. You're brilliant. I'm expected to do everything. I feel ignored. All of these are judgments. Say them to someone that has had trauma and emotional safety goes right out the window. To create emotional safety, we need to experience connection. Connection occurs when people are seen, heard, and valued without judgment and it's the cure for trauma. The Big B Method teaches people how to create connection through communication, even in conflict. The Big B Method holds that connection is not an abstract concept, but rather a concrete, replicable process that can be taught and measured, helping people to rewire their fight, flight, freeze response. Learn a language that intentionally keeps one another safe and have all the goodness that comes with connection including productive work and school environments, and safer, happier homes, families, and communities. If you are looking to increase connection in your work environment, school, police force, or personal life, begin your journey with the Big B Method now. All right, so yeah, that video really, what I like about that video is it really just explains trauma, ACEs, fight, flight, freeze, and how NBC really does work in action. And so what Dr. Marshall Rosenberg, who's actually the creator of nonviolent communication, what he says is that when emotions are high, intelligence is low. And so using this process has actually been studied and shown to help bring our brains back online when we're in a fight, flight, freeze response. So what we're gonna focus on today is using empathy 
um, and helping others grow new neural pathway, new neural pathways, right? So that's how that's how um, trust is built and connection is built. And I'll finish this slide off with, I love this quote from Brene Brown also, connection is the energy that exists among people when they experience being seen, heard and valued and when they can give and receive without judgment. And that's what this process is all about. All right, and like I said, I promise this is the last video. I know it's like front heavy on the video content, uh, but then we'll get into more interaction and uh, that sort of content. So Samantha mentioned at the beginning of this webinar that um, a miracle and I actually had the chance to record this video back when we both worked for DCF in 2021, I believe, and we did a video and it's on YouTube. And so we're gonna be showing part of that video because it's um, one, because the Florida Institute for Child Welfare is awesome and they did like an amazing job with the recording of this for us. Um, and it's just uh, a great example of describing um, one of the key processes of nonviolent communication, which is using other conversational responses versus responding just with empathy. All right, so like I said, bear with us. This is, um, we're showing about 13 minutes of the video and then we'll move into more interactive content. Question. And the next part that I wanna talk about is other conversational responses. So when someone comes to us with a challenge or conflict that we're dealing with, or maybe we're involved in a conflict with that person themselves, we often respond in ways that we refer to as other conversational responses. Sometimes we give advice, sometimes we one-up them and say, oh, that's not too bad. You know, what happened to me was this. Um, other times, you know, we ask a bunch of questions to them. Sometimes we educate the person or explain or correct what they're saying, like, oh, it didn't happen this way. It actually happened this way. Or we sometimes even add fuel to the fire. Like sometimes a friend will come to us complaining about another friend and we'll like side with them and agree with them. And often that doesn't make the situation any better. And it's really not that other conversational responses are bad or wrong. It's simply, you have to think about what's going to be most connecting for that other person or for the young person that you're working with. Do you think they want you to ask a bunch of questions or give your advice right off the bat or explain or correct them? Or do you think they simply just wanna be deeply heard about what's going on for them in that moment? So we always try to start with empathy first. Remember the pun, presence, understandings, and the feelings and needs guesses. And then after giving empathy, you can always ask if they're open to hearing your advice or anything else, asking questions, educating, whatever it may be. But you always ask. So after you give empathy, you'd say something like, are you open to hearing my advice? So I know that was a lot of information, uh, but now a miracle and I want to model two different conversations. The first showing what the other conversational responses actually sound like. And then I'll pause after each response to a miracle. And I encourage you to guess what the other conversational response is that I'm offering. And then we'll model what the empathy process looks and sounds like. So again, sticking with the presence, my presence with her, my attention is with her. I'm going to be reflecting what I'm hearing her say, and I'm going to be guessing her feelings and needs. And so hopefully you'll notice a difference between the two role plays. So Miracle, feel free to go ahead and start telling me what's going on right now with the situation you're dealing with. So I have a friend named Jasmine. She's 24, and I was providing her a lot of financial assistance for maybe three to four months and it started impacting me and like me well can I pause you there like I you know I had a roommate in college that literally just like stole all my money and like did it over and over again so I think you know this situation is not that bad like like I had a roommate steal all my money So what other conversational response was I just doing to you? Are you one-upping me? Yes, I am one-upping you. All right, I'll let you keep going. And then <laughs> they kind of messed me up. <laughs> uh, so me and my friend Jasmine got into an altercation about me providing her financial assistance with her food and 
her hygiene products that she may need and I let her know that I can no longer provide her that financial assistance and she took it as that it was about paying her back and so we got into an argument well you know this is my advice I would just cut off all ties with her like she just seems like a really toxic person to have in your life and if she's stealing all your money like you shouldn't have a relationship with her What other conversational response was I using there, you think? Questioning. Questioning and also advice giving. It was a little bit of both. Advice giving. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, again, she took it as that it was all about paying her back. And I told her, like, if I had to sum up the amount of money that you owed me, you obviously would not be able to pay me back. But it's not about that. It's the principle of two friends shouldn't have to be scraping up money to try to, like get each other food because we're spending money on each other like if one of us has money I'm spending I use all my money on her and then I'm out and then when she gets money she has to scrape up money and use it all on me and you know like uh, I just I'm I'm wondering like how much money have you given her and why do you keep giving her this money and why do you think it's your responsibility to take care of her So what other conversational response was that one? Questioning. Yep. I was asking you a bunch of questions. (laughs) All right. We'll do one more. Okay. And so after um, we had our talk, she didn't want to be friends anymore. And I kind of just told her that. And like, we can't be friends until you get a job where you could support your own self. And then like, because like, you're not really being a friend or like kind of a leech in. I just you know she's just she's just so crazy like I can't believe her she's just like taking total advantage of you and you know I just she's just like a little crazy I think you need to like like just separate yourself from her and you know like I'm your friend so like I'll be here and we can forget all about her Uh, what was that one you're definitely adding fuel to the fire yes I was adding fuel (laughs) to the fire (laughs) all right so that was the first role play and now we're going to model the second role play which I'll have a miracle reshare her story again and pay attention to the way I'm responding to her this second time sticking only with empathy sticking with being fully present with her basically reflecting what I'm hearing her say so she knows I fully got her and then taking some feelings and needs guesses. All right, Miracle, so feel free to say the story again and we'll model it the second time around. Okay, so I have a friend named Jasmine and we've probably known each other for three months and we had a disagreement about the financial assistance that I was providing her. So for me, it was more of I'm not stable enough to keep providing her money. And she took it as, I'm going to pay you back. I'm going to pay you back. And I let her know it's not about you paying me back. It's just the principle of two friends should not have to be scraping up money to give to each other because we keep using money on each other for things. Mm-hmm. And can, I, can I pause you there so I can make sure I'm fully getting what yes, you're saying? Ma'am. Okay. So what I'm hearing is you have a friend named Jasmine. You've been friends for about three months now. And you got into a disagreement recently over money. Yes, ma'am. Um, you've been helping her out, paying for things, um, supporting her a little bit. And you brought it up to her that it was a concern for you uh, to, to be supporting her and scraping up money. You're, you're paying for things for each other and you're spending money on things. And I'm wondering if it's if it's something about feeling maybe like overwhelmed with everything around the finances with her? It was more of me feeling used and then everyone around me could like see that she was kind of taking advantage of me. So you, uh, had, you had thoughts that she was using you. Yes, ma'am. You had thoughts. So the feeling is probably maybe really frustrated and maybe a little embarrassed. Yes, ma'am. Is that it? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so embarrassed that people were seeing that, you know, there was thinking around her using yes, ma'am. using you. And when we go out, I'd have to pay for the food mm-hmm. or just 
things you would pay for in general, like I had to pay for and not so much as her. Yeah. And so we had a conversation and I told her that um, maybe we shouldn't really be around each other and be friends right now until like you get yourself together and you should focus on yourself until you get a job because you're not really being a good friend when you just kind of like use me yeah. for my money. Yeah, so you noticed when you were going out for dinners and meals with her that you were paying for her food. And so you decided to have a conversation with her about this. And you, I heard you say that you told her that you may want to take a break right now from the friendship and that, you know, you, you'd let her know that it's probably important for her to get a job. Uh, so, yeah, and, uh, you yes, know, ma'am. originally I heard, you know, some level of embarrassment and maybe like frustration. Uh, But the needs here, it sounds like, um, if I had to guess, maybe something about, uh, like, some understanding on her end, or what do you think? um, For me, I think it would be... Consideration? Consideration. Trust, because she would also lie. Like, when she did say that she would be able to pay me back, like, she also lied about paying me back. Yeah. And so I just got to the point where I'm like, do I mean worry about paying yeah. me back anymore so trust like yeah I need so trust. you really want to trust from her yes ma'am yeah that that you know if she said she was going to pay you back that she was actually going to pay you back sustainability because i feel like like i want sustainable relationships mm-hmm. and like a solid foundation yeah and probably financial sustainability yes, for yourself financial too. yes ma'am yeah and i also heard you say and i think it's important to reflect this part is I heard you mention that it wasn't really, when you brought up the conversation with her, it wasn't really about you wanting money back from her at this point. It was more just like, you want this moving forward for her to not, uh, or for you to not have to pay for her things. Yes, ma'am. So I also needed understanding. Mm -hmm. And just her, like, taking herself out of her shoes and putting herself in my shoes. Yeah. Because everyone gets tired of that eventually. Yeah. Yeah, so understanding and maybe some, like, awareness on her end, too. Yes, ma'am. You yeah. Need, and clarity. Yeah. I would need, yes, I needed clarity. She needed clarity. Awesome. Yeah, so clarity. Cool. Thank you. So, Miracle, do you mind telling me a little bit about the difference between the first role play and the second role play, from your opinion? So, in the first role play, you were keeping like the attention off of me and making it more about you Mm -hmm. and on the second role play you focus on me you try to understand the story and try to see it from my point of view and ask me how I felt about it and what you are needing to and what I was needing yeah yeah so notice I reflected what I was hearing you say the second time and I guessed your feelings and needs I never told you what you were feeling and needing and even you brought up additional needs that you were mourning in that situation yes ma'am in the first role play I was like more it made it harder and frustrating for me to tell the story whereas the second one was more comfortable and it flowed easily and I was able to get everything out that I had to say yeah definitely yes ma'am yeah I would love to hear from folks who are on our webinar tonight what is your go-to other conversational response that you typically use when you're responding to others. It may depend on, you know, who you're communicating with, but what is your go-to one? Do you like to give advice? Do you like to educate? Do you often want to relate? Do you want to one-up? Do you want to ask a bunch of questions? Feel free to drop that in the chat. Yeah, I see advice giving, advice, relating, giving advice. It's hard to not do that. Relating, yeah. And then which ones really bug you? Advice, absolutely, yeah. Asking questions. Um, which ones really bug you when this when someone does this? Like I know what, like I just had like a interaction with uh, my mom, with my mom and it was about advice giving. And you know, it, that really bugs me sometimes when she gives her advice. So which ones really bother you? And it, again, it also probably depends on who that person is. But one-upping, gaslighting, yeah. Educating or asking a bunch of questions, escalating, yeah. And the, the 
the thing about other conversational responses is it's not that these things are necessarily bad or wrong. It's just that our whole lives we've been conditioned to respond in this way. And so it takes time to pause and really think and reflect. And um, I meant, I think I mentioned this quote in the very beginning. Uh, our biggest communication challenge is we listen to respond, but we don't listen to understand. And so if we if we just take a time to pause when we're having a conversation with someone uh, and and really try to identify what am I feeling and needing in this moment? What are my judgments that are going on in my head about this other person? And what might that other person be feeling and needing? And that's that's like master level, right? That's hard to tap into if we're in a conflict with another person, but that's ideally where we want to shift into. Yeah, listening to respond is very much about ourselves rather than the other person. Yeah, exactly. Just like a miracle said in that video, it's the first round was really taking the attention off of her and really making it about me and how I was responding. And the second round was keeping the, the focus on her. All right, so let's, let's move along here. So when we think about empathy through the NBC lens, you're really only going to use this process if you want connection with the other person, right? We have to come into this space and step into this space with that openness to, to want connection and want understanding. And a lot of this work is really about our approach, about our tone of voice, about nonverbal communication, which includes like our body language. And so when we, I mentioned this a little bit in the video and actually modeled these three components of empathy, which are presence, understanding, and feelings and needs guesses. Uh, but I'd love to hear from you, a miracle. Like when we think about how we show presence to someone, or in other words, like how do we know that someone is present with us? I'm curious what you think about that. Like how do you show presence to someone? Um, so presence is more of a nonverbal type of communication. So in the video, you did a head nod, um, eye contact. You obviously don't want to be looking everywhere else besides the person that's talking to you. And you really want to be there mentally and emotionally. So you don't want to be in your head, like, trying to think of a question. You want to listen to the person's full story. No cutting off, because then it kind of confuses them and again don't just like automatically think of a response if you don't even know the whole situation yet yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So. so true oh i think there may be a little bit of an echo so we may need to have to mute you in the meantime sorry about that no that's fine yeah so like a miracle was saying yeah it's really about like physically being like with that person, but also like mentally, emotionally. And this is hard when we're in a conflict with someone, especially, right? Because like a miracle said, our mind so quickly jumps to how am I going to prove that I'm right and they're wrong, right? And then we're just not present there, right? So it's all about building this muscle of presence. And then when we think about understanding, how might you show understanding to someone through the NBC process? So understanding is more verbal communication. So as you guys could see in the video, she kind of stopped me and was like, okay, so what you're, what I'm getting from what you're saying is so basically restating or summarizing what you heard from that person up. Um, Mm -hmm. you understand like or you can just simply say you know I understand what you're saying but just to be sure this is how you feel this is what's going on now that person knows that you are okay like they're listening okay yeah. and then continue on with their story and they know that you're listening and that helps the person feel more comfortable with expressing how they feel yeah, exactly. Because how often have you been talking to someone and they're like, oh, yeah, I got you. Like, yeah, heard, like, got it. And then whatever comes out of their mouth next, mouth next just totally proves that they didn't hear were, like anything that you said. Right. Mm -hmm. So this understanding piece 
is just simply about reflecting back what you're hearing them say. You don't have to capture every detail, but really just summarizing and making sure that they got you, right? Because most people really what they want is just to be fully heard around what's going on for them. They may want advice eventually, but we always ask, like, are you open to advice? But I always recommend starting with this, this specific empathy first, right? Uh, and then when it comes to the feelings and needs guesses, it's always about guessing what that person is feeling and needing. Like I said in the video, um, we're not telling them what they're feeling and needing. It's just kind of like a flashlight. We're trying to shine a light on what's going on for them. And the, and the feelings, we didn't show this in the part of the video, but in earlier in the video clip, we talk about the feelings on the top half of the sheet, which um, will uh, Samantha is going to send in the chat a link to that. Um, there it is. And so we have this, you know, feelings and needs sheet. So on the top half of it, it's if you're experiencing something under that, it's probably because a need is getting met. And if it's something on the bottom half, it's probably because you're mourning a need or a need is not getting met. Um, Jeanette, uh, can I read something someone said in the chat that's really good? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm not talking. That'd be great. Um, they were taught that saying something will saying something we go through the prior question of trust will what I say build trust and create an environment of sharing or will it tear down that trust? Like mm -hmm. I really like that because the yeah. other the other person is needing trust from you in order for them to hundred percent communicate their feelings. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thanks How for that, Miracle and Charles getting judgment back. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when a miracle and I were prepping for this, uh, we wanted to do a another quick example of modeling empathy. I know we did one in the video example that was shown a couple minutes ago, uh, but she came up with an example uh, of a situation with uh, pretending that she is a uh, uh, I'm so used to saying student now because I work in education. I don't work in child welfare anymore. But a child, a teenager in foster care in a group home setting. Right, Miracle? Yes. Okay, so do you want to give a quick, like, like, explain what that situation is so that um, everyone on the webinar can understand? So I actually aged out of a group home, so I had, like, a lot of different ones that I wanted to do. But I really like this one. Um, because not only have I kind of been in this situation, but a lot of kids in the group homes. So I called my biological mom, and it was during Christmas break, and sometimes we are allowed to go see our parents, our bio parents. And, you know, I'm talking to my biological mom, like, hey, like, can I come see you during break? You know, I would really like it every other kid in here is going to go see their parents. Like, I would really love to come see you. And remind you, I, I, I'm asking this like two weeks before Christmas. And she was like, she said, oh, I don't think I'll have enough gas to come get you. You know, I already had plans. Um, basically, I'm going to have to stay in my group home alone with my group home mom. And she can't come get me after that conversation i was very 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 frustrated and my so i hung up the phone and my group home mom wanted me to basically go christmas shopping with her i didn't want to do anything with her and you know i told her you're not my mom um you know she's not here but that doesn't make you my mom. I don't want to spend Christmas with you. You're just my group home mom. And I was being very rude and disrespectful. And she took that very personally. And maybe I did not communicate the correct way, but I was really upset that I couldn't go see my parents like every other kid. Yeah. Okay, thanks for sharing that. So 
for that context. So um, now what we're going to do is I'm going to, and yeah, just, just wanted to say that's how brave you are just to share that piece in front of everyone who I'm sure you don't know most of the people on the webinar. So thanks for that. Uh, and now we'll move into modeling empathy. So a miracle is going to be coming to me. Um, I'm playing myself in this example. A miracle and I have known each other since 2016, right? Is that what we determined or 2017? Um, 2017. You met me when I was 16. That was 2017. And I'm 22 yeah. now. So. Yeah. So a miracle was in uh, Florida Youth Leadership Academy, which was the program I coordinated at DCF. So we've known each other for a while. All of that to say, she's coming to me in this situation and I'm offering empathy to her around um, what she just shared, all right? So um, I guess for the purposes, since you already kind of explained the context, maybe you can just kind of like reshare a little bit about that and all model the presence, right? Being fully with you, reflecting what I'm hearing you say and using my feelings and need you to take some guesses at what you're feeling and needing. All right? Yes, ma'am. Um, okay, so it was Christmas break. Every other kid got approved to go see their parents and spend time with their family during the break. Took my chances, called my mom, checked with my mom first. And again, I called her two weeks before. And I asked her like, hey, I would love to come spend time with you and the family during break. And she said that, you know, she might not have enough money mm -hmm. for gas to put in the car. And, you know, she already made plans that obviously did not involve me. And I took that very, very hard, very frustrating. Mm -hmm. Me being the only kid that was going to be in the group home with my group home mom. And after, you know, I hung up the phone, very upset. Group home mom wanted me to go Christmas shopping with her. I was very disrespectful and told her she's not my mom. My mom is not here. And I didn't want to do anything with her. Yeah, and again, I was very disrespectful. Um, can I reflect what I'm hearing you say so far, a miracle? Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, so I'm hearing that in the group home, um, you about two weeks prior to Christmas one year, you called your biological mom and um, you were hoping to spend some time with her and she let you know like that she wasn't gonna be able to come pick you up because she didn't have gas money or gas to get you and after you hung up on her, um, you're, you started talking to your, your group home mom and she came up with a strategy like you wanted to, you know, take you out Christmas shopping. And you said you, you know, you had thoughts, you said that you were disrespectful and rude. So you had thinking and thoughts that you were disrespectful. But I'm wondering if in that moment, it was really about feeling like really maybe frustrated and if I had to guess um, like a, a deeper feeling underneath that maybe like perplexed and a little bit withdrawn and maybe something about embarrassment too because I know you mentioned like all the other kids in the group home were going with their parents their bio parents and then like you were just going to be sitting there and so maybe that's like a little bit uh, like a level of embarrassment if I had to guess correct yeah and yeah just maybe like a little insecure and if I had to guess some needs maybe something about just like trust and consideration um maybe being seen um Yeah, so maybe something about like, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to think of any other needs that might be present for you in that situation. Can you think of anything else? Maybe mattering, mattering or importance? Ooh, yeah, importance. Um, love, support. Mm, yeah, yeah. Honesty. Mm. Yeah, that. so that honesty kind of ties into trust, but more honesty. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. 
All right. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, in the chat, what did you what did you notice? What did you um, observe in that? Did you notice the presence, understanding, and the feelings and needs guesses? Um, did you what else did you notice in that empathy dyad? Sort of consider the deeper anger at your bio mom not being able to be there for you and not being mature enough to deal with those powerful emotions and then directing it at someone else because you couldn't direct it at your mom. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes. That's a great point, Charles. I didn't get into that piece of the empathy dyad, but uh, that would have been a great like next component to dive into with a miracle around <clears throat> her frustration and anger coming out onto the group home staff member and what the needs are in that situation. And then probably even maybe moving into like what the group home mom might have been feeling and needing in that moment as well. All right, I don't see anything else in the chat so we can just move along. Thank you for that, everyone. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about feelings versus thought feelings. This is a really important piece of empathy because Often when we respond to people, we think we're using feelings, right? When we say the word, I feel, but then what follows that is actually what we call a faux feeling or a thought feeling. And so if you go to the um, Google Drive link that um, Samantha dropped in there, um, oh, there it is right there, the feelings versus thought feelings PDF. So that goes through a bunch of different examples, and again, that, that sheet is not meant to be an end-all, be-all, but it shows examples of thought feelings versus like what the actual true feeling is and then what taking some guesses at what the need might, might be underneath that. And so I'll give some examples, uh, but really the reason why we use, why we want to stick with true feelings instead of thought feelings is that it really helps us avoid escalating the conflict. It avoids adding more fuel to the fire when we can just stick with true feelings, true emotions, and leaving the judgments, leaving the blame, leaving the evaluations out of our emotions and others. So uh, anytime we say things like, I feel abandoned, I feel attacked, I feel unappreciated. Those are all putting judgments and blame on someone else. And the reason, again, this matters is because if we were to say that to someone, it's not going to lead to greater connection, right? It's going to leave more openness to, and room to argue back with you. What are you talking about? I didn't manipulate you. I didn't attack you. I didn't disrespect you. Like, right? Versus if we just were to say, I feel really frustrated, I'm angry, I'm annoyed, I'm really confused, I'm excited, I'm happy, right? All of those are examples of like actual emotions. And so sometimes too, we say things and notice this when you leave this webinar tonight and go out there into the world, notice how many times people say, I feel like, or I feel that, and what follows is not an actual feeling. And so again, it all matters because if we want connection with this person, especially if we're in a conflict with them, right? This is where it really matters is, is if we're in a conflict. And we say, I feel like you just don't care about me or I feel disrespected. It's not going to help the situation more likely than not. All right, so we're going to go through uh, a couple examples here and a miracles, um, a miracle, can I hand it over to you? Yes. Okay. So we're going to go through a couple examples. And in the chat, essentially what we're going to ask you to do is identify on your screen there, we have one through seven, whether that, that is, wh whether you think it's a feeling or a thought feeling. And some of them might be a little bit confusing, so we'll be able to explain it. But for that first one, I am frustrated. Do you all think that is a feeling or a thought feeling? And go ahead and drop that in the chat. Awesome. I'm seeing lots of feelings. <laughs> seeing lots of feelings. A miracle, is that a feeling or a thought feeling? 
That is a filling. Yes. And why is that? Um, you're not putting blame on the other person. Um, mm -hmm. You're frustrated. It's the feeling. Yep. Yep. And why some people may have guessed that it's a thought feeling is because there's not that feel word in there, but you actually don't need to always have the feel in there. It can be, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm annoyed, right? So it's, and that's actually a way to make it sound a little bit more natural. Um, some people don't love talking about feelings. So it's kind of a way to like infuse it into language um, without like bombarding being like, well, I feel, I feel, I feel, right? Um, so I'm frustrated, all right? Let's move on to the second one. I feel manipulated. Go ahead and drop in the chat if you think that's a feeling or a thought feeling. I'm actually curious about this one. <laughs> oh, they're smart. They're smart. Okay. <laughs> Lots of thought feelings. A miracle. What do you think? That is a thought feeling. Mm -hmm. And why is that? You're blaming the other person. You're basically telling the other person that they're manipulating you, and that is just going to turn into a big argument. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. Number three, I feel disrespected. Feeling or thought feeling? Yeah, I saw someone put judgment in there. That's another way of saying thought feeling. Miracle, what do you think? Thought feeling. Yep, you're agreeing with pretty much everyone else too. And for the exact same reasons, right? Putting blame on someone else. All right. Yeah. Number four, I am anxious. Is that a feeling or a thought feeling? I know, I'm like, ah! <laughs> Feeling. What do you think of miracle? That is a feeling. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's you're an internal sensation, right? Yep, you're expressing how you feel without blaming the other person. Mm -hmm. I feel hopeful, number five. Feeling or thought feeling? Uh, I think this was a tricky one. <laughs> what do you think of miracle? That's a feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, hopeful is a feeling. All right, I would agree with you on that one. And then I feel like he's just an angry person. Feeling or thought feeling? Awesome. Yep. Are you in agreement with everyone? Yes, ma'am. Thought feeling? Yeah. Thought feeling it is. I feel unappreciated. Feeling or thought feeling? Well, you know, this was a tricky one, wasn't it? <laughs> Wait. Um, yep. I think. Yeah, you know, this was the tricky one. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think it is? It's a thought feeling. Correct. Yep. I would agree with you on that one, right? Because. <laughs> Unappreciated is like you're, it, it may sound like a feeling, but it's actually, again, putting blame on someone else that they're unappreciating of you, right? What might be the actual feeling if you're feel, if you have thoughts that you're unappreciated? What do you think might be your actual feeling, a miracle? Or anyone else if they want to drop it in the chat. Um, another feeling, unappreciated. Um, if you if you're thinking that someone's if, if you're you, if you have thoughts that you're unappreciated sad frustrated actually used that's a tricky one that's also a thought feeling right it sounds like a feeling but I feel used um, that's that's a um, that's a thought feeling also same with taken advantage of and ignored those are all thought feelings right so it's hard it's really hard to do this work. Yeah, lonely, exhausted, those are feelings, yep. Yeah, so just be, just start thinking about and having some awareness around um, 
some words that we that we use that we think are feelings, but actually might have a little bit of evaluation in them. I Great job. I'm disappointed. Yeah, disappointed. Yep. That's Great. Really- Okay. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a tricky one. I, I go back and forth with disappointed, whether it's a thought feeling or a feeling. But I, I tend to lean more towards a feeling. Yes, overwhelmed. That's a true feeling. All right, let's move on to now needs versus strategies. So we'll do the same activity here with this one. But again, the feelings, remember, are pointers to whether our needs are getting met or not. And what Marshall Rosenberg says about NBC and about conflict is that all conflict is a tragic expression of unmet needs, meaning we haven't been learned, we haven't, we haven't learned or been educated to speak from a needs lens and a needs perspective. And so often we jump right into strategies and strategies are not like bad. I'm using quotes because bad is a judgment, but they're, Strategies are not necessarily like the worst thing to do, but really it's important to identify the need first and then jump into strategies because there are many strategies to getting our needs met, but in conflict, we often get stuck arguing at the strategy level. So I'll give like a quick example. So let's say I relax by like after work, I want to go on a walk and maybe watch some TV and my husband may want to like, I don't know, he doesn't do this, but like play video games, for example, or like, you know, go read a book. So we have different strategies for meeting our need for maybe relaxation or connection together. Maybe he wants me to play video games with him, you know, whatever, but we haven't, like talked about the fact that we both have this same need for relaxation and connection. And so once we identify that need, then we can identify different strategies to get that need met. So maybe we can both agree that we want to uh, go on a run together after work or go on a walk together, that that strategy would meet our needs together. Right. And so we're it's really important to identify first the need and then talk about strategies. So uh, let's do some examples here. Uh, same, same concept for this activity. <clears throat> oh, and the other thing I wanted to mention on that is if we express our needs, we have a better chance of getting them met, right? It seems so simple, but we haven't been educated to like, speak our needs and it does take time and it can be sometimes a little bit uncomfortable to um, express that. So if that is like a discomfort for you, what I just encourage you to start doing initially is just start thinking about like, if you're upset in the moment, what am I needing right now? Right? Maybe it's not even communicating that to that other person. It's just shifting your mind out of that cycle of blame and judgment and into what am I feeling and needing? All right, so a miracle when we say, actually for everyone, um, let's go into this activity. So number one, I need support. Is that a need or a strategy? Awesome, what do you think a miracle? It is a need. Yep, you're in agreement? Yes, I, I want, oh wait, what were you saying? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. What about I want respect? This can be a tricky one, but. Need, some needs, some strategies. What do you think, a miracle? That is a need. Yeah, yeah. And so the reason why this one is tricky, kind of like the last one on the feelings versus thought feelings, we don't necessarily have to use the word need there, right? I want, I value. Those are all other words that we can use instead of needs if we want it to sound a little bit more natural. But respect is is on our list, right? Respect is a, is a need. I don't know where it is, but it's somewhere on there. <clears throat> um, 
What about number three? I need you to be nicer. Is that a need or a strategy? And what do you think, a miracle? That is a strategy. Yep. Yep. Because <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> you may be. You may have a need for consideration mm -hmm. or kindness. Mm -hmm. so. Yep. Yep. Need you to be nicer. That's a strategy. It's also kind of vague, right? Like what does nicer even mean? Like we could argue with that, right? So the need might be like a miracle set actually for consideration or kindness, maybe also respect. All right, let's move on to number four. I need emotional safety. Need or strategy? Are you in agreement with everyone else there? Yes, I am. Yep, Correct. that's definitely a need, right? One of the biggest needs, actually, in my opinion, that I think often is the first thing to go when we have conflict. All right, number five. I need you to clean up, uh, clean, I need you to clean your dishes up. Need or strategy? I feel so proud of everyone. <laughs> what do you think, a miracle? Are you in agreement with everyone? Yeah. And what, what do you think might be the need if someone were to say that, the need underneath that message? Responsibility. Um, mm -hmm predictability so you know knowing that the dishes are going to be done mm -hmm. yep yeah and then once the need is identified and shared then we can move into strategies right talking about how we're going to try to get that need met and also identifying what that other like what the kiddo might be needing in that situation and trying to find a strategy that will meet the need what about i value having purpose need or strategy Awesome. You think that's a need or strategy, a miracle? A need. Yep. Yep. Purpose, right? So like I said earlier, the value, want, those are all words that you can use instead of saying need. But then anytime it's I need you, right, that's often not a need. That's a strategy. All right. So we're going to do one activity here. Um, on jackal versus giraffe. So you may be like, what the heck? Why is she saying jackal versus giraffe? So these are like the two animals that like, like the creator of nonviolent communication, Dr. Marshall Rosenberg has used to basically like demonstrate different ways that we can respond to, um, or to ways that we can respond when someone comes to us, maybe with a challenging message or something that they want to share with us, whatever that may be. And the reason he uses these animals is because a jackal, if you've heard of it, it's an animal that's like really low to the ground and like quick to react and respond. Um, and the giraffe is the animal that is like, you know, has obviously everyone knows what a giraffe is, has a long neck, is a mammal with like the largest heart. So often it's like, you know, seen as an animal that's less reactionary. Um, although I have seen videos of giraffes fighting, and if you haven't seen it, it's a little terrifying, but that's beyond the point. Um, so we can, uh, there are four ways that we can respond to uh, messages, and we can either jackal in, jackal out, giraffe in, or giraffe out, as you can see on your screen. And so jackal in messages um, often sound something like you're blaming yourself, Jackal out is when you blame the other person. And we tend to be pretty good. At, I tend to be pretty good at that, right? Before I learned NVC, I did a lot of blaming other and then sometimes blaming self. So sometimes both, right? And then giraffe in with this new way of speaking and thinking about um, how we communicate and interact with others. When we giraffe in and have our giraffe ears on and they're facing inward, we can identify our own feelings and needs and then when we giraffe out, it's really about taking guesses at the other person's feelings and needs. 
All right, so a miracle, should we, do you wanna move into the scenarios? Yes, ma'am. All right, so a miracle and I are gonna model scenario one and then we'll engage with the audience for scenario two and three in the chat. So um, supervisor to you as an employee, so I'm the supervisor, correct? You're the employee. How come you are never on time for anything? How would you jackal in? So I might say something like, oh, like, I can never get it together. I'm just so stupid. Like, I'm always late for everything. And I'm just, I'm just like, I gotta, I gotta be better. Like, I'm just, I, I can't get it right. How would you jackal out? Ooh, this one's fun. I would say like, well, you know, you're never on time to things. And how, like, I've seen you come into work late and you're always on my case. Like, how come you're always jumping down my throat about everything that I do wrong? Yeah. So blaming the other person. Yep. Um, how would you giraffe in? Okay. So this is identifying my own feelings and needs. So I'm using my feelings and need sheet. So if I were to hear how come you are never on time for anything, I might be feeling as the employee, I might be feeling uh, overwhelmed, maybe maybe embarrassed, um, maybe something about like jittery and nervous um, because I have a need for understanding, maybe like a little bit of compassion um, maybe to be heard about like my situation and what's going on for me in this situation. Yes, ma'am. How would you giraffe out? So I'm identifying or I'm taking guesses at my supervisor's feelings and needs. Yes, so she might be frustrated, also maybe overwhelmed, maybe a little irked and annoyed. Um, because if I had to guess, maybe she or you have a need for um, consideration or trust, maybe some ease and some awareness, if I had to guess. All right. So this is where your feelings and needs sheet in the link way above. Uh, maybe, Samantha, are you able to relink that? Because we've had a lot of chat activity. So I want to make sure folks have access to the feelings and needs link directly on Google Drive. Uh, so if we can get that dropped in the chat. Uh, and now we'll move into the second scenario. So um, let's say the teen in the group home to you. Oh, go ahead, a miracle. Sorry. You're fine. Oh. Sorry, I, I don't know where it went. Um, okay, so teen and group home to you as a staff member. Um, you never listen to anything I'm saying. How would you jack win? So blame yourself. So everyone on the chat, feel free to drop in into the chat. If you're jackling in, what might you say to yourself? If you are the staff member hearing this message from a teen in your group home, you never listen to anything I'm saying. How would you blame yourself in that situation? And there's the link too. Um, thanks, Samantha, for dropping that in. I have too much on my plate. I've got so much going on. I haven't been present. I've just been so distracted. Yeah, those are great examples. Yeah. I'm so busy. I must have not understood you. Yeah. And what might, what about if you jackal out? How would that sound if you're blaming the other person? If you're blaming the teenager in the group home? What might that sound like? You never listen to me either. <laughs> Nothing you ever said ever makes sense. <laughs> you never tell me anything. I'm just one staff person. You don't ever get to the point and make things and say things that don't make or matter, don't matter or make sense. You only argue, you never talk with me. Yeah, exactly, right? What about giraffe in? How might you be feeling and needing 
or sorry, what might you be feeling and needing if you're the staff member in that situation? And this is where the feelings and needs should come in, in handy here. Yep, that's another sh example, Cheryl, of Jackal out. Yep, you might be feeling frustrated, overwhelmed, sad, those are all feelings, yep. And what might you be needing in that situation? Useless and ignored are actually, not to, not to call this person out, but those are actually uh, judgments or thought feelings, right? So just, that's why the sheet is, is super helpful to just stick with, with um, feelings. Yeah, so that's a need, acknowledgement, right? Clarity about the situation, cooperation. Yeah, great needs guesses there. <clears throat> Need some time to organize, maybe some space. Yeah, some time some until I get some things situated. Value, yeah. Awesome, great job everyone. All right, cool. So. The last one is then giraffing out. So taking guesses at what the other person is feeling and needing. So what might this teen in the group home, if you had to guess, be feeling when if they were to say something to you like you never listen to anything I'm saying, what might that teenager be feeling? And again, trying to stick with this sheet here. That's linked above. Anxious. Ignored is a thought feeling. So if you have thoughts that, if that person has thoughts that they're being ignored, they might be irritated. Yeah, maybe frustrated. Maybe lonely, impatient. Yeah, that's a great needs guess there, Charles. Need to feel like they matter. Uh, mattering is right, is, is on there. Um, maybe needing like to be heard, right? I think that would be the biggest needs guess there. If, if someone's having an experience of like having thoughts that no one ever listens to them, they're probably needing to be heard, right? They're wanting connection maybe to, be, to have mattering and importance. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for participating in that. Yeah, so Charles, that that need is actually a huge need for so many people. That that need is all about autonomy and choice. Um, mm. So that is a that's a big need there. Part of the decision making process, having choice, having voice, having autonomy. Yeah, great point. All right, and so when we think about this other component of empathy, we can also so we've been talking about what empathy looks and sounds like when you're offering it to someone else but often like it can be hard to access that when we are triggered ourselves and so what we offer is this opportunity for self-empathy which is like to take a moment to pause if you notice like your lid is flipped right your brain went offline along with that other person that you're talking with and anything that you say or do in that moment is probably not going to be connecting for you and that other person, like it's okay to pause. It's okay to wait. And we, we use this acronym, what am I thinking or, or sorry, what am I thinking or why am I talking? Because anything I say right now is not probably going to be connecting, like I just said. So self-empathy is a way to pause and notice, like, I can't give empathy to this other person right now because I myself need to get hurt around what's going on for me. I am too upset, too triggered right now. And so you can ask yourself, what is the thinking going on in my head? Am I saying things like, how dare this person? Like, they're being, you know, so disrespectful to me right now, right? All of those thought feelings that we just talked about. And that's okay to go to that space, like in your mind. But it's really important to have awareness that that is where you're at, like, Okay, what I'm saying right now about this person, I own it as a thought. It's a judgment. It's an evaluation of them. But 
I know that's what it is. And I'm not going to say it to them because it's not going to lead to greater connection, right? So knowing when, when you're in thoughts, when you're having evaluations, because it can be a spiral, right? Like you can, like, now that you know this, you can start paying attention to the thinking going on in your brain. And we call this jackaling. Jackaling is okay, right? We just talked about jackaling in, jackaling out. But we're not doing it to that other person. And you're jackaling with awareness in your own mind or to a person who knows this process. You might also identify what are the observations, right? We'll talk in the second webinar, uh, part two, later in a couple months about what are the observations versus evaluations. So I'm not going to get into that. But what are the facts? And what are my own feelings and needs in this situation? Now, can I access and think about what might that other person be feeling and needing in this moment? And again, it's not about like, it, it takes time to learn this language. It's, it is like learning a new language. So don't expect yourself to like go out there and like get it right every, every time, right? So like the first step is really just Noticing when you're in judgment in your own mind and evaluations about the other person or the situation and noticing what am I feeling and needing and what might that other person be feeling and needing. And then do I want connection? Do I want to engage in this conversation with the other person? So those are the components of like what self empathy looks and sounds like and kind of just like questions that you might want to ask yourself when you notice your frustrated or upset or angry or whatever it may be. All right. So as we uh, think about, actually, I was going to give a quick example here around what this would look and sound like. So let's say I'm a case manager working with, uh, working with a child in foster care and they're um, coming to me. They're really mad and angry because of a placement change, uh, a placement change decision by the courts, right? And this teen is, is coming to you and really taking it out on you, thinking that you as the DCM had a lot of like sway in this decision. And so you're noticing in that conversation, like, oh, crap, I'm getting angry. I'm getting frustrated because this person's coming at me and I have thoughts that they're attacking me. Right. I don't feel attacked. I have thoughts that they're attacking me. <laughs> I have thoughts that they're disrespecting me. They're saying things right now that are not meeting my needs for kindness, not meeting my needs to be heard. So what am I feeling and needing right now? So this is all things that can go on in your head. You can even ask them like, hey, can I, can I take a minute right now? Because I'm really overwhelmed with just hearing this and I really want to show up and like, respond to you in a way that's going to be connecting and I just can't do that right now so do you mind if I take like a minute just to like step outside of the office just to just to cool down here for a sec right and so you're you're kind of protecting that that conversation and that trust there so you might identify like okay I need empathy right now what am I feeling and needing what are my thoughts I might be feeling maybe worried maybe anxious, maybe overwhelmed, because I need understanding, I might need ease, I might need some consideration to be heard, right? Okay, Whew. I've identified those things for me. Now, what is this teen needing? Like, what might what might she be needing right now? Like, maybe she's really angry and frustrated. And, and maybe she's feeling helpless and overwhelmed, because Maybe she has a need for clarity and for hope or something like that. And then you're like, oh, wait, like, it's probably that she really is mourning this need for predictability and, and stability and choice, right? Like, she just had this major placement change. And it's similar, very similar to the example of Miracle shared, shared earlier with her bio mom, right? Talk, talking to her group home mom. And once you can access that feeling and that feeling and need guess for that other person, it allows so much more like openness and flow in the conversation. So you can go back in that conversation and then give empathy to this, to this person who's talking to you, right? Guess their feelings and needs, give them that experience of being heard. I cannot tell you all how many times like I'm in meetings at work and situations and like 
personally and professionally, like when people respond with other conversational responses versus just sticking with empathy, just being fully with that person, reflecting a little about what you're hearing and guessing what they're feeling and needing, what a shift it makes in the conversation to offer that to them versus like trying to respond in different ways, right? And so just just thinking about that as you're going forward about, you know, how you respond in conflict personally and professionally, what other conversational responses you typically use and are your go-tos, um, and then thinking and considering, you know, how you might infuse some of these skills that you've learned, uh, these skills and concepts from today um, into, into practice. Amir um, Cole, was there anything else that you wanted to add before we um, wrap up? Um, Nonviolent communication is the key. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Yeah, and so part two um, is going to be focusing on expression, which is another component of nonviolent communication. So we talked about empathy today, and expression will be when you want to share something that was frustrating or challenging for you. So I'll probably use that exact same example that I just shared about the, the teenager coming to you as the dependency case manager how might you give empathy to them, but then how you can also express and share how that was for you to hear what they said um, about you or to you in that moment in your office. So there is space in this um, communication process for you also sharing how things are for you, all right? So the last slide is just additional learning and training opportunities that are out there. Uh, some of you have probably heard of the Bigby method. Um, Dr. Cindy Bigby uh, lives in Tallahassee and does a lot of NBC training and work. Um, I do a little bit of work with her through the Bigby method. I can't uh, hear you. You can't hear me? Or is it just me? Uh, I can Hopefully hear everyone else can hear me. Okay. Um, that's weird, a miracle. Sorry that you can't hear me. Um, and then there's a podcast there and the book. This is the Marshall Rosenberg book. It's called Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life. Um, one of the most life changing books for me in terms of learning this, this skill. And then Samantha is going to give a little bit more information about some other learning opportunities. Also, this podcast is really awesome. It's all about connection podcast. Yes, so the Institute is working on a learning track, so it'll give people an opportunity to learn a little bit more about each of the empathy and expression with nonviolent communication, and then um, opportunities to practice it within our learning management system. And so keep an eye out for that um, update coming along. We'll definitely have more information for part two. And here is the list, uh, mailing list that you can sign up for to keep in touch with everything that we have going on. Awesome. Thanks, Samantha. I just wanted to express so much gratitude uh, for being on with us tonight. I know it's late back in Florida time, uh, but just thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being on. So good to see you, Brandy. And thank you also, A Miracle, for just sharing and uh, being a part of this as well and co-presenting with me.